right. We will get started. Hey, Don. Got it. everyone. It's nice to see you all here again. Thank you. So much fear and fury in our communities right now. And I, I, I struggle with what to say and, and sometimes with what to do. And I read this morning uh, something written by Kirby Hossman, who is the CEO of his own uh, of a marketing and communications firm. And he wrote something um, titled please stop saying that in which he talks about current times and that by saying when this is over when we refer to when this is over um, as we talk about current times we put ourselves kind of in a, in a passive mindset and so we think we will just wait until things um, change things will get better by themselves and then we can go back to normal, back to work, back to living our lives. Instead, his take on it is, we should say, now that we are here, we really have to accept our new reality for the time being so that we can create new solutions on how to succeed. And he goes on to say, we need to live in the is, the present, our present reality. Now that we are here, it's time to get to work, he says. Please pray with me. Almighty, we are thankful for this, for this day that you have given us, for its blessings, its opportunities, and its challenges. May we appreciate and use each day that comes to us. We pray for strength and guidance for each day as it comes, for each day's duties, for each day's problems. May we be challenged to give our best always, and may we be assured of your presence with us. Amen. All right. Greet your neighbor, rotary wave. All right. Welcome, everybody. We do have... Um, We've got, let's see, where are we? We've got 50 some folks with us right now. And um, I believe we, we have probably at least one, if not a couple of guests. So welcome to everyone who is here. A couple of announcements. Um, the first announcement is that uh, Youth Exchange student Louisa um, has notified us that she has a ticket to fly home on June 7th. So later this week, um, she will be heading home. Louisa, if you are here, I, I 
I'm not sure if you're with us yet, but I do want to say it has just been a pleasure to have you here with us this year and um, sharing your experiences in our meetings, whether live or virtually. And um, we certainly hope to see you back here virtually and in person at some point. So good luck to you. I want to take a minute also just to note the tremendous job of installing and troubleshooting the flags for the Memorial Day holiday, the first holiday of the year. Wow, I um, was copied on probably not all of the emails that were fluttering around, but I can tell you that when it came to troubleshooting in a two and a half day period, I logged 75 emails back and forth where there was a, a, a flag that needed troubleshooting or installed um, and the responses came immediately from those of you who are helping and the comments that we received from several of our community members about how good it made them feel to see our flags going up again. So thank you to all of you who had a hand in that. Um, it, was, it was really a, a great thing to see. I will just do um, a couple of reminders before I introduce our speaker. Um, if you have questions, please type them into the chat box. If you are able to, uh, Secretary Lynn will be monitoring the, the questions. And um, if, you are, if you are joining us by phone and um, aren't, don't have access to the chat box, you can also send an email to Lynn if you have a question. Um, and also certainly um, when the time comes, just pipe up and unmute yourself if you need to and ask a question in that way. Um, any of those options work for us here. So I'm going to introduce our speaker today. Rotarian Judy Wortham Wood is the third executive director of the Mental Health and Recovery Board of Wayne and Holmes Counties, a role she's held since 2008. Her extensive experience in both the public and private sectors includes being the Deputy Director of the Ohio Department of Mental Health and the CEO of a comprehensive behavioral system. She also has demonstrated abilities to develop successful relationships, collaborative partnerships, and effective communication at all levels of government. Judy also has a comprehensive understanding of provider issues, consumer family issues, and problem solving skills. She holds a BA in sociology from Miami University and an MA from the School of Public Administration at The Ohio State University. Please welcome Judy Wood to the Worcester Rotary Zoom podium. <laughs> Thank you. Zoom. It's all yours, Judy. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank Kim for uh, asking me to speak and also Bobby Douglas, who kind of recommended this. And I really appreciate it because we really need your help now. So this is a very relevant time for us to be talking. I need Rotary members. We need heroes. And I'll tell you more about that. We need you to help us stabilize the effects of the COVID-19 is having on the mental health and well-being of our friends and neighbors. Um, be, and my goal at this time today is to help you have a better understanding of who we are and what we do. You will be able to recognize the importance of mental health and substance use disorders, um, the awareness locally, so you can direct anyone who has those needs to proper providers, but also that you'll help battle the stigma associated with mental illness and substance use disorders. Most importantly, that you will understand the collaborative role we play in the community and the need for our presence here to coordinate the effort for a healthy community. Before I move on, I want to help you a little bit with context. Some of you are newer since I last spoke, believe it or not, several years ago. Um, we've noticed many people are aware we exist at the Mental Health and Recovery Board, but aren't necessarily exactly aware of what we do. And here's the answer. 
we ensure adequate and effective prevention and treatment services are available to our community. We provide funding and we monitor the programs and services available to this community, which are offered by our local funded partners, which are there on the screen. We ensure that funds are utilized efficiently and effectively by those funder partner agencies and we work collaboratively with them to assure quality mental health and drug addiction treatment services are available. The next question that's usually asked is where does your kind of funding come from? The funding we give to Anazal Community Partners, Catholic Charities of Wayne County, the Counseling Center, NAMI Mocha House, and 180 comes from the funding sources illustrated here. As you can see, the breakdown is we get 50% of our funding from the levy, state funds approximately 25%, federal funds approximately 20, and grant funding 5%. Typically, after the funding sources are explained, the next question is, where's the money go to? And it goes to our funded partner agencies to support the services they provide to the community. After you understand where the co funding comes from, and where it goes to, inevitably we hear, why do we need you? The answer is simple. The funds are supplied by the Mental Health and Recovery Board and are vital to our funded partners to ensure services are seamlessly provided to the community. The Mental Health and Recovery Board often is asked to pay for services for people who cannot afford their treatment. And in this day and age, that's particularly important. Many individuals who receive services from our funded partners cannot afford to pay for those services. We never want someone to refuse care or refuse to seek services because they fear they cannot afford it. The mental health and addiction treatment is vital in the equation of a healthy and safe community. The funds pri provided by the Mental Health and Recovery Board to our local funded partner agencies are essential to the financial stability of these organizations and the success of their programs. Next, I wanna to talk to you about COVID-19. And as I love Kim's reminder to stay in the present, um, as you know, this has been a quite challenging time for us. Over the past few months, we have all been made aware of the small things we can do that make a big impact on decreasing the spread of the virus. I'm sure like me, you've thought of the things you can do to help. Now I'm asking for your assistance as I share about how to best support the behavioral needs in our community post COVID. As the surge of the health issues comes down, we need to focus on what comes next. This topic truly affects us all. You may be asking, what's this mean? We in the behavioral health system and the health system have learned that other states and many counties in Ohio are experiencing increased overdoses and suicides following the COVID-19 pandemic. We began a week ago to receive epi alerts, um, alerts about epidemiological increases in certain areas above what's normal regarding overdoses. And in our region, several of those counties and areas have been highlighted. We know in some other states, following the first surge, behavioral health related deaths are now exceeding COVID deaths. So this is serious. So that's again, why I thought this is the perfect time to talk about it. So what can we do? And again, you're seeing um, funded partner agencies are still open. So we've learned about hand washing, distancing, and masks. We've now learned that the mental health and addiction interventions we can take to prevent a suicide or an overdose surge is critical. Now's the time for Wayne and Holmes counties to prevent these. In the past, we've used local coalitions to decrease spikes in overdoses and suicides. Our opiate task force focused on decreasing overdoses during the epidemic. 
Um, and we've been able in the Suicide Prevention Coalition to focus after the 2008 recession to decrease suicides. So this is not the first time we've had to collaborate to efficiently use resources to combat these strategies. We have experienced leaders and partners to help, but it takes all of us, not just a few, to make the needed impact. This is a time that many people have experienced this trauma. Through recent research, we know that trauma impacts can cause increased mental health and addiction issues and other health impacts per the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences Research. We know that this pandemic will place many of our children and citizens at risk of mental health and addiction issues. Our goal is to focus on prevention, treatment, intervention, and building resilience. Who's affected by this? There are examples of this need among us. And I'm gonna give you a few. There's an example of a 15 year old girl. I can think of three examples recently who because of the pandemic um, either, either overdoses or runs away or both due to the stress include unemployment by the parents, no access to friends and peer support, no school to attend, no outlets of pro-social sports or activities. Several of these youth have needed hospitalization or crisis stabilization. Then we're trying to keep these girls safe and alive with treatment and family treatment. Another example is financial loss to a middle-aged men or women right now as we, are experienced, as we experienced in the 2008 recession. Um, and we even lost a Rotary member during that time. So we want to think about how do we prevent these losses when financial strife or stress during a recession hit. Also a divorced woman. We, can, we can't imagine dividing and losing up her home and her family as it is. So she considers suicide. Someone like me or someone else you know. A woman in a domestic situation with a history of experiencing violent abuse. She fears she can't leave during this virus safely. So she stays until stress results in an eruption of the family. So we have existing clients who are wondering how to remain in mental health and addiction treatment during this time, alone with limited support people and alone with thoughts of suicide or addiction. We have seniors that are alone, frightened, and experiencing fear. Who do these people call? Do you know where to refer them if they call you? Do you know how to listen and help? I'm going to tell you. Also, I want to let you know we've received many, many increase in crisis calls. We have an additional 20 services a week needed. We have an average of 45 calls a day. We've had up to 73 calls a day um, and over 10 service calls for serious services, suicide, overdose, threats to life. So we have lots of people surf suffering from anxiety, um, thinking the world has ended, thinking there's serious triggers, if, especially if you experienced a world war, thoughts of suicide, etc. And crisis with what you can find in terms of supplies and supports. So what can you do? We need business and community representatives on our local coalitions. We would welcome and strongly encourage you to participate in the opiate task force on the next slide. Um, and the meeting is the second Friday in June at 1.30 by Zoom. So now, it's easier than ever to attend these meetings as a community representative. We lack business representatives um, and we need more community representatives. Many of you are participating. The Opiate Task Force will be renamed and broadened to include other substance use disorders, including stimulants and other drugs and alcohol addiction. So we've had those changes going on. Next, you'll see a chart that focuses on the drug overdose deaths we had. As you can see on the chart, 
They reached a high of 37 in 2016. And then in 2017, we were able to go back down. How, and then today in 2020, we ha have listed seven deaths, but again, we're having a few more. Um, so we wanna be attentive. We've made good progress, but it's time to make progress again. On the next slide too, you'll see the, the drug category involvements in overdoses. So you'll notice that in 2016, there was a high of fentanyl. Uh, and we checking the slides, get a little variation there. This one gives overdoses in Wayne County. So it shows that we've had overdoses that haven't resulted in death, but the number of overdoses. And then on the next slide, we have drug category involvement. And what you'll see is <clears throat> in 2016, we had an increase in fentanyl prescription drugs and multiple drugs. Um, more recently, just so you know, we've had an increase in meth, amphetamines, and multiple drugs, and even fentanyl researching a bit. On the next slide, you'll see that suicide prevention um, deaths, and you can see after the 2008 recession, we went high there, up to 15 suicides. And it's, it's a tough battle. We bring them back down with education and information and focus and the economy even. But now I would like to tell you that we've, we're down a little bit. However, um, in 2018 after, or I'm sorry, 2019, it rose to 20, which was the highest ever. So uh, I want to thank um, Nick Cascarelli. He provides these slides and you can find them on the health department's website and you'll find white papers about this if you want to learn more. Um, so right now, officially in 2020, we're at approximately three deaths. I'm pretty sure there have been a couple more since then. So that gives you kind of a visual of our community and where we've been with these issues, but now we have to do more. And on the next slide, you'll see that we have QPR and other evidence-based trainings. So we're right now converting the QPR suicide prevention stands for question, persuade, refer. And it, in simple terms, it's how in one hour you can learn to ask the question about suicide and the signs of suicide, persuade them to get treatment and refer them to an effective treatment. And trainers, including me, will be offering these by Zoom um, in response to the pandemic very soon. We know that in agriculture, we're having increased depression and needs. We need to focus. I was supposed to do a training for the ag community. I, we got one in, the other one had to be postponed. And then I heard back their needs are even greater now for obvious reasons with the economy and the pandemic. Um, so also we have mental health first aid and it's an eight hour training that you could have us provide to you uh, for your organization. Now is a good time by Zoom. We're also trying to get that one rearranged. They've gone to half of it by electronic and now we're, we're moving toward the rest. <clears throat> so these are all good opportunities that we'll be able to provide more. And, and the general thing is to get everyone educated. It doesn't take a special degree in behavioral health to do any of these. And on the next slide, you'll see that um, NAMI, Wayne Holmes has worked with the CIT officers who are specially trained to deal with mental health issues and they're gonna become mental health first aid trainers as well. With addiction, on the next slide, you'll see that we also have addiction education by Dr. Labor. I'm throwing out a hint um, to others that, that will try to work on getting this virtually. The other thing you'll see there on your screen is the book, The Addiction, The Addictaholic Reconstructed, um, book by Dr. Labor, and you can get it at a very good price on Amazon. Um, it talks about many of the things that 
she says every day in her Addiction 101 training that we've had numerous times in our community. But at this time, we can use some reminders about what's going on with addiction and how to focus and support people. So why be trained in any of these things? Why? Um, and the reason is you can change a life. You can save a life. You can change the conversation. So we know that one in five people experience a mental illness or addiction. Your family, friends, colleagues, neighbors, all included. If it were your child, what if it were your grandchild? Do you need to know how to get treatment? These illnesses are treatable, treatment works, people recover. So you wanna know, how can I help? The biggest thing you can do is listen. Listen with your heart, listen with your head. One of the initiatives out now is Strive for Five. And it's saying, how do you focus with five people? Check, check out with them how they're doing, listen to what's going on, offer support. My number is now five plus five plus five. So we should just keep that going. If you know five people you can call, check in on, give them support, and think about if they had an issue, how would you help them? How would you help them to know what's available? On the next slide, you'll see that during this time, our agencies, four of them focused there, have offered up that they would like to offer two initial 30-minute consultation sessions available at no cost. So if you or someone you know needs um, to talk about the anxiety from COVID, needs to talk about um, the stress of the unemployment or just the stress of living today and how am I gonna redo my life? How do I keep safe? So these are available to you. We've listed the phone numbers. After this presentation, we will forward a one-page summary to um, share uh, President Kim to get out for folks so that you've got the numbers because we realize we can't give you a brochure. They're also on our website. And we also have listed below the crisis 24-hour hotline number. Also, we have treatment navigator number for each county. So you can get the numbers that you need for somebody to get the care they need. Also, we have wire locally who can refer and you're seeing on the screen also that we have a crisis text line so for the person who doesn't want to call this is a statewide number it doesn't come into our crisis team but it is available um, we've also added a homeless navigator and some additional supports for homeless with specifically if they have mental health or addiction how that we can get them the treatment they need, provide a safety net for people needing housing. And we know we already have increases in recovery housing, residential treatment, group homes, but we'll keep focusing on that and keep the crisis line out there. So I wanted to let you know that hope is available and you can offer it. There's hope and there is help and treatment is available. So we want you to know that teleservices are available, our full continuum of residential, intensive outpatient, group treatment, um, treatment for mental illness, addiction, domestic violence, and crisis, and the 24-hour navigators. We know that trauma is real and treatment is available to move toward resilience and recovery. We have some new resilience, youth resilience examples in our community. The Art Center um, is having pro-social activities with arts, et cetera, that they can get the materials to the person and you can participate online. And I wanted to let you know that we've uh, received two capital grants um, that have been authorized, one at the Art Center and one at Rittman Schools for after school programming that'll support as we return um, to the next phase of what we're doing. So you can visit our website, 
for a list of resources and contacts. We also, when the COVID um, man, pandemic started, we realized early and often that you needed lots of information from a video perspective. So we have videos online on our website and they include videos for youth about telehealth, about anxiety, um, and each of our agencies, even more than, than are listed on the next slide, are available to you for addiction and mental health treatment and telehealth and more. Next slide, let's see. Yes, those are all those videos I was just telling you about. Each of our agencies, we have those. So we wanted people to be able to get the information. So the next issue is we need your help. You are the heroes that we need. You can help. Rotarians have almost rid the world of polio, so Rotarians can surely address the post-COVID behavioral health need. You, again, can bring hope for people to hold on to tomorrow till they can get the treatment or support they need. We need all of you to reach out and listen. Please remember that people give clues to cl people close to them. Don't ignore the clues, listen, learn, and reach out. You are all of able to do this. Lend your ear to listen and let yourself care as you always do. Help others access treatment and give the hope that you can give. We, you can call any of our funded partner agencies to get assistance. We thank you so much for listening to me now and listening to others and taking the actions that you can that will save lives, prevent suicides and overdoses and future trauma reactions. And if there's time, you'll get to see my face. I realized with all the slides, you didn't get to see me as much. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Judy. I will um, stand by for questions. You must have done a fine job of covering all the information. <laughs> that, that's a first for me. So, <laughs> um, but I do want to thank you for just being willing to listen about this today because um, we have a potential need and the more that we can all focus together, it, it appears that that's the best that we can do to head this off and let people get the help that they need. So I really, really appreciate both the invitation, your willingness to listen today, uh, and to partner with us through this next era. Thank you. So there is a question that just came through, Judy. That we paused. <laughs> yes. Um, Doug Druschel asks, if you were the governor, would you have written the shutdown order any differently so as to minimize the mental health impacts that the shutdown has caused? Well, I never presume that I'd ever be the governor. <laughs> um, but I think the part that we liked and that we worked hard at the very, very beginning, literally at the very beginning, like the day or so, I started, I called and tried to figure out how we, can we get some videos because like you said, we weren't sure that people would know that they could get telehealth. Uh, technically, one of our agencies had telehealth. The others had to be brought up immediately. And um, I would have liked the word out earlier that those telehealth services would be provided and, and the regulations for those. I did encourage our agencies to get out front um, I was thankful they did that. On the other hand, 
some of them had to take some risks and financial risks and I let them know I'd do the best I could. However, we had to wait because we couldn't have board meetings either who dreamed that we'd have an emergency where we would lose access to face-to-face -face services in some ways and I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but also um, that we lose the opportunity to know if those services could be paid for. So once we found that the the Medicaid and insurers would pay for those services as well, we were able to move forward. Um, but we couldn't even immediately have a board meeting because our board meetings had to be in person until they could pass guidelines about that. So I think um, not knowing what I could have had, but I, I think information is power. So the more information we could get to the most people and the more that we could get that information out there because we we wanted people to be able to get the services so i don't know if i could have changed the world but again the most information the other thing is we ca we have kept our services open so all the residential services all the intensive outpatient um, many of the face-to-face -face services that needed to happen have continued visitors have been limited from some of those facilities. So we didn't have to totally shut down um, and couldn't actually. And crisis service had to be provided from day one. The first weekend we had to figure out how to move those to tele. Um, and I was in contact with the crisis team regularly. Luckily they did everything they needed to do uh, immediately. So we were able to move forward, but I think the, the shutdown did create a little bit of a, an issue for us, but the first, then when people found out they can still receive services, just like you can receive them from your doctor, you can get behavioral health services. And that's why we wanna give people a chance to try them too, talking on the phone or by tele like you are now versus in person. We're finding that some people are more comfortable so we're getting some big improvements there as well. So that's that's been good uh, in that way. And we've had a few families that were feeling somewhat resistant. And remember that we have uh, services in the homes too. So we had to pull those back and do those by tele and some new creative versions. The good news is I think we will keep some of this as we move forward, This this will be a part of our practice as we go forward and just offer more options for folks um, so that everybody can have the treatment they need. Thank you. I, I don't know that I answered that perfectly because I had trouble with the fantasy of if I were the governor, but <laughs> more and more information was the key. That was very good information, additional insight, Judy. I. Um... I think it it's good for us to hear from you and the and the partner agencies around the services that you are continuing to provide and those first few days where things were questionable to have to really pivot so quickly and um, to even be enabled to hold your board meeting like you said um, those were right. things that that most of us wouldn't have probably thought of. Um, I know one of the things when you and I were talking about this um, a week ago, one of the things that you shared was in talking about the tools that are available for this, this surge in, in behavioral and mental health concerns. Um, and, and the way you posed it to me was if, if your neighbor or your daughter or your grandson has an issue, do you know who to call? Do you know what to do, how to help? And it isn't that, um, that I have to be the one to help and say all the right things. I just need to know who to get my loved one or my neighbor or my friend connected to so that he or she gets that help. Right. And I think that we have to remember that folks who haven't experienced problems might experience things now. Um, some of the stories I asked a crisis team to let me know about uh, beginning on Friday, when I read them over the weekend, um, it was painful. 
And that's what's going on. Many, many people are experiencing great mental trauma and pain and need the supports. And I think the more that we're there, both our system of care, but you as the person, because when we all get in trouble, we call a family member or a friend or someone we trust. That's who we call. Uh, and we reach out or we get very silent and don't reach out. So that's the other reason we want you reaching out to people. Um, I had somebody that I had been trying to reach and they hadn't contacted me back in several weeks and I was getting concerned. I had someone else check on them. Um, when I finally talked to them, they had had some issues uh, and we were able to get them what they needed. But we have to remember that, that everybody has a need right now and Rotarians by who we are care and we want to be there and we want to be the one that can help whether it's a health pandemic or a behavioral health need we want to know how to help folks and like you said kim it was wonderful to talk with you to just try to put the thoughts together because it became clear to me that so many people need these services right now the earlier we get them the better in terms of offering up services. Um, we know that we'll have a surge after adolescence uh, and children are seen by more and more folks. We know that some seniors have not been, um, had the accesses they need for everything. So we know there's some expectations. We also know in stress that we all have issues, whether it's mental health or addiction, and we wanna be okay with that. We wanna also say, it's our right to have these problems. All of us will, or have someone we know have these issues and be willing to say, it's okay. I've had some of these problems and I'm okay. That's what everybody can do right now to help each other and to help their family members in the home. So, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Anyone else, any other questions or comments to share? All right, thank you again, Judy, much appreciated. All right, 180, uh, their Facebook page this morning shared um, a post that today is Say Something Nice Day. So I will leave you with a plea to say something nice. I don't think that's gonna be too difficult for any of us as Rotarians. Um, and we will get to you the the one pager that Judy mentioned earlier with um, the referral list with some contact information so you can have that should you need it. Um, Louisa, if you are with us, good luck, safe travels to you and uh, make the most of this final week in Worcester here. We, uh, we hope that you connect with us again at some point in the future. And I will leave you with this thought since it is the first week of June, let's remember that first question, especially of the Rotary four-way test. Is it the truth? Thank you all. We stand adjourned.